Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, today, we, uh, this is the second uh, workshop, the third workshop day with uh, Dr. Brian Vizi from South Africa. Uh, we are delighted to have him with us. Uh, and also we have Dr. Gandhi from Tanzania. He's the first visit uh, uh, for both of them in Egypt. And they are fascinated by the museum and the pyramids and uh, everything in Egypt, which makes them happy. Hello, Musa. Salam alaikum. Uh, today he will give. Okay, uh, salam. Today we have uh, uh, will give the presentation of uh, how to do uh, conduction system pacing. Uh, I like it to be interactive. Please, uh, we we can uh, you can join uh, with us live. We are uh, we are live now, uh, and we record everything in case you miss anything. You can find it on our YouTube channel, uh, Ekra Educational Channel. But in Arabic, <laughs> uh, we are just uh, getting ready. Uh, some uh, hello, Anwar. Anwar Zorfi uh, from Iraq is one of the uh, team of Dr. Mervat, and he is now a very efficient operator in everything: devices, ablations, and welcome, Anwar, to the online. Min tani Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Vizi, Vizi, yeah. Doctor Vizi will give us a short uh, introduction about his experience in Egypt. This is his first visit. Doctor Vizi, how did you find Cairo? If I'm looking at the dictionary. I can't find the words to describe Cairo, oh, but I'll okay. use a simple word: amazing. Amazing. Yeah, amazing. And um, for me, definitely, definitely coming back. Yeah. Because the experience, not only in Cairo, but in the lab as well. Yeah. So in the lab as well. Oh. Okay. Okay. So um, uh, uh, you did not get a visa. There is an agreement between Egypt and South Africa that South Africans do not need to, buy, to pay even for visa. So we are delighted that this, these governments are doing this for us yeah. and for you to have your experience with us here in Egypt. And uh, we will visit. Where are you going to visit, guys? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I'll bring my team to you. Mm -hmm. I'll bring my team so that you can, we'll have a lot of fun together, OK? OK. Definitely. So we'll start with the presentation about conduction uh, system pacing. Dr. Vinzi. Thank you very much, Prof, once again for inviting me. Um, this morning I was just having breakfast with Prof Henny and Sharif, and I was just telling them that when I first, when I first met Prof, 2020, 2020. I, I used the, the words, who is that woman, you know? I didn't know who she was, and looking back, I'm embarrassed of myself because I should have known. But these are the things that keep us apart because we don't know what the right hand is doing. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So I met Prof and her team 2020 yeah. in Mombasa. 20, 20, Not Mombasa, 20, Nairobi. 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 Formation Nairobi, of Afra. Yes. And November 2021 in Mombasa. Yes. So I decided that by hook or crook, uh, I'm going to come to Egypt. I, I, I had no, no choice. Now, I also um, made Sharif and Henny. Definitely, I'm coming to Alexandria. <laughs> no, that's, that's for sure, I'm coming to Alexandria. But I was really humbled because I've been doing EP since 2005. Maybe three introduction, but like proper EP 2005. So I considered myself experienced. Then I met Prof, and she was talking. I said, hmm, that woman. And then second time I said, I think I like the team. I'm going to come visit. So yesterday and the day before yesterday was amazing for me. Then I realized that we really have to work together because the level of energy in the cat lab, the changeover of patients, uh, the nursing staff. There's a guy who's not here today. I've forgotten his name. The nurse who scrapped for all the cases yesterday. He went to his village. He's from Mansura. I've never seen something like that. Back home, they were like, no, I'm going for lunch. No, I'm going for tea. He was here the whole day. So for me, these are all the things that I take back home and say, guys, we can, 
make ourselves better. The only thing I'm not taking home is going home at three in the morning. I'm still <laughs> going home. <laughs> so, but the rest, seriously, and English you often use the word humble loosely. Really, I'm humbled. Really, really, I'm humbled to you. Um, like I said, I've got no words to describe. But anyway, so coming to the subjects uh, back. Okay, uh, I don't know how far back I've gone. Mm. To the, maybe a slide before. Yeah. So we're going to talk about connection system pacing today. And one thing we know is that RV apex pacing does work. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's been working for, for many, many years. And I'm not one of those people now that there is a new technology to say the old technology doesn't work. It does work. It's got its own people where you can feel comfortable that it can work. And, um, but the new conduction system pacing, I think, gives us a choice. And I'll show you some of the cases uh, where if the right ventricular uh, apex pacing doesn't work or septal pacing doesn't work, you say, I can do uh, conduction system pacing. Briefly, like we all, well, most of us do CRTP via biventricular pacing. If you can't get to the CS or you can't get a good branch, phrenic nerve, thresholds, epicardial, so, you know, you send to your surgeon. But now we haven't sent to surgeon probably for two years, and that, that's good. Uh, so that's what we talk. Doesn't mean that RV apical pacing doesn't work, but there are limitations. When I started CRT 2005, I must say, we never we looked at the left bundle branch block or wide complex. Post pacing, we never went back and measured the QRS. I don't know if you do, but we never measured. That, okay, tall R wave in V1, negative in, A, in one AVL, it, it looks good. You're pacing the LV, but we never looked at the QRS. But we know that when you talk about CRT response, of course, we mean different things. I think the hard points is death, how the patient feels, and EF. So that's what you talk about non-response. But other people talk about a lot of other things. Uh, what about the patient who does not get better, but you sort of like stabilize their heart failure? Is that a positive response or not? Patients say, doctors still feel the same. But when you tease out those things, CRT via biventricular pacing, maybe 40% non-response of people can argue and say, no, it's more or it's less. But I think if you just look at heart endpoints, 40%. And one of the reasons is that biventricular pacing is non-physiological. If you think about it, you're pacing endocardium on the right ventricle, you're pacing epicardium on the left ventricle. Yes, the QRS may narrow and may look good, and the majority of the patients do improve, but 30 40% is a big amount of patients that do not get the benefit from the device and is not cheap. So people started looking at the QRS, and we now know that, without going to details, just looking at the slides, the narrow the QRS and it makes sense, those patients tend to have better outcomes. I don't want to press the wrong one. None of them work at the moment. Oh, okay, I think it's the four. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Yesterday we had issues. Uh, I think also when we talk to the companies, it's always nice not to have just one lead like that yesterday. So we're looking for a canter or a shape uh, for our first uh, CRT patient. This one lead, it, it comes out of the beam. It's not deep. Well, it, uh, I can't remember who commented. Yeah, okay. yeah, should have commented that it's not going to be a good anatomy. Because even getting to the CS, it just subselected a very large branch. Yeah, so, and he said, okay, S-shaped canter is, he only had this one, and it's a bipolar, but it worked at the end, it's, but it's always nice to have um, uh, a quadrupolar mm -hmm. Now, none of it is working. Right. Yeah. So, and that to me, once again, because CRT, once again, is still going to be here, it's still in the guidelines, Biventricular pacing is still class 1A compared to everything else. Most people still say you go there only if you can't get to the good vein or you can't get directions for whatever reason, then you can do physical pacing. 
But just briefly, because yesterday we were talking about the QLV, what it means, I'm going to touch on that a little bit as well. Yeah. We know that we always have um, a middle cut of vein. We always have anterior cut of vein. But those are the veins that we try to avoid. Okay. This one is supposed to be posterior lateral. On lateral, this is the one that we um, always go for. But like Prof was saying, something that I've never had, subdiaphragmatic. Uh, sub uh, I'm a, uh, I, I tried yesterday well, to go and look. I, have it I didn't day. find it. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. When I put it, but it was four in the morning, three in the morning. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I thought you are perforating mm. the chest wall or something. Mm. It has branches. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, this is a big vein. Yeah. Let's use it. Yeah. When the lead went all through mm. in, I said, great. Mm. This is an epicardial branch. Mm. No matter what, where it comes from, mm. but it gets to the heart. Tofu, uh, Tofu, yeah. Uh, was it you who sent me this Salah. yesterday? Salah. Was it Salah? Salah. Was it you? Salah. Yeah. So um, I think on the PS8 program system uh, stimulator, uh, all Medtronic, Biotronic, they always ask them to connect the ECG because then you can see how late it is. So that's going to be the lead because we know this left bundle branch block. That means the LV is getting depolarized very late on. So just by looking as it's put on the clips, you can see how late you're sensing. But it's always nice to have a number. And now we know that those numbers mean something, whether you believe it or not. But basically, when we implant and look at the radio radiograph, it's anatomical, right? Yes. But this is an electrical problem. Okay, so we want to correlate the electricity and anatomical. Most of the time, anatomical correlates to electricity. Um, so we know now that the later you are from the QRS, usually left bundle, when you're putting a lead and you're sensing that part of the myocardium, how late it is. So it's Q from a QRS and what you're sensing, LV, uh, Q, uh, QLV, uh, QLV. Yeah. So you're sensing that. The later it is, the better. The metric number is 100 milliseconds. You get anything better than that. You're in a good position, right? But now the people say, if already put in the ICD or the RV, you can do RV, LV, yeah. There are even people who even said, in a very few sub-selected patients, we did say interocardic vein is not a good vein, but if you stuck, sometimes put in interocardic vein and do these measurements. Very few patients, I don't have a number, that sometimes you can get a QLV, that is good, yeah. and then put it there and wait and see, right? Particularly if you haven't developed the skill of, or oh, you don't have apparatus for the lab uh, uh, band area pacing. So these are the things sometimes, as I was watching yesterday, okay, we can improve that and do that. I'm going backwards. Yeah. So we decided, so I just said early on, uh, because I always like CRT. I like EP more, but uh, CRT is quite nice. You know, I really, I really CRT is the fruit of the day. Yes, but yes. <laughs> So we decided, okay, I'm going to do this, uh, this uh, conduction system pacing. At the time, we are just calling his band area pacing. So overall, so when I met Prof for the first time in uh, Nairobi, uh, I met a guy called um, Olujimi Ajijola. Uh, from the States. From the States, yeah. It's a Nigerian uh, uh, from the States. Yeah. So they, they, obviously, I didn't know him and I was presenting. And at the time, I'd done 72 patients on his band pacing. And um, they just published a paper that showed the first paper that you can use RA and his bundle pacing in lieu or without the LV lead. Okay. Yeah. And only to that, only done about 25 patients. They said, no, we've done so many patients. Put it in paper. That's where Prof and your team comes in. I put it in paper, but never publish it. So we end up doing about 120 patients. So I'll come back to that. Um, and everyone at the time was doing luminless. Medtronic, because Medtronic was the first company to say, you can use our apparatus to do that. Um, but I realized that if you dislodge a luminous lead, it's not designed for RV endocardial pacing. It's very difficult to put it where you want. Uh, say you've got RA of two, or we were struggling yesterday with the RA. So I just said, okay, let's do the stylet. At the time, I didn't know there was a paper on stylet actually. When I went back, stylet driven. Yeah. So I tried stylet driven. So we talk about that as well. So 
connection to pacing, I must say, when I first had, I can have a left bundle, branch block, and pace proximal to that, doesn't make sense to me. It's not going to work. They say, oh, no, it does work. I'm like, how does it work? So if you think of the anatomy of the his Pekenji system, it's a very organized fiber. So even as they exit from the AV node, the branches that will end up in the left fascicular are predestined from that. So it's not like when they get to the branch and then they cross over. So you can have a disease proximally uh, that will give you left fascicular block. Disease proxima that give you a complete left bundle branch block. So a disease here, a disease fiber here, doesn't necessarily mean that the disease is here, it can be proximal. So if you stimulate this conduction system distal to the lesion, you can get good results. Or sometimes its disease is not dead. Sometimes if you put higher stimulation, you'll be able to overcome that. Sometimes you know that you can have septal branches there. All those mechanisms make it easier for to pace for something. Theoretically, you think left bundle is a distal disease. I'm pacing proximal. It's never going to work. But if you understand the anatomy of the fibers, the fibers, basically, if it's one word, they are predetermined or um, predestined. Predestined to be left bundle or right bundle. Um, we'll, we'll come to this slide. It never works with me. Is it me? No. Let me just I try it so that I don't want to trouble you. Okay, can you go back? Yeah. It doesn't seem to. It doesn't seem to work with me. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. Oh, yes. Maybe I should press a bit harder. Okay. So this was my uh, first patient when it started. Complete heart block, elderly gentleman. Um, actually, it, it ended up being a funny story because he was my father's boss. I didn't know him for about 30 years. And only when I said, hey, I know Evasi, he used to work for me. I said, ah, that's my father. But I was in the lab at the time. So this is him. Oh, uh, it's not clear. Um, it's OK. It's OK. Yeah, I can see it's RV apical pacing. Um, EF was low. Um, atrial fibrillation, complete heart block. Um, so one of those beginner's luck, we saw everything that day. Beginner's luck, metronic, luminless, uh, his pacing. On the PSA, can someone was asking me about current of injury, yeah. see that. So what does it tell us? It means that if you don't have an EP system, you can't still do conduction system with just a PSA or a programmer. We saw the his bundle, so we saw everything. But looking back, it's not always the case, all right? which is another reason why it's easier to do left bundle pacing compared to his pacing. Because his pacing, most of the time, you really need to see where it is. So that was him, and then six weeks later, uh, you can see his nice pacing, um, what you call selective. Um, and selective pacing basically means that you capture the his and little or no myocardium around. And we'll talk about the anatomy. I don't want you to dwell. I don't do his pacing anymore. Uh, but I think for those who are still interested, selective his bundle pacing for me compared to non-selective is not a big deal because electrophysiologically are similar. If anything, it's better to have a non-selective because you're capturing the his and you're capturing the myocardium. Yeah. The R wave would be larger. Uh, if you've got issues with pacing threshold, which we're going to talk about, it's better to have non-selective. The ECG doesn't look as nice, but long term we now know retrospectively it's probably better to have a non-selective. So I'm not going to dwell much because it doesn't interest me, but if, like if you want to ask any question on selective versus non-selective, please do ask. So, of course, we started uh, and we had a discussion yesterday uh, with Henny and, and other guys about when do you do connection system pacing alone and no backup? Mm -hmm. When we started, maybe first 20 patients, everyone had a backup. Uh, and then we started maybe getting a bit more comfortable. This is what we are left with. I can see this is Solia 5.6. Uh, we'll live like this. This will be all four patients for CRT, uh, his band, um, ready pacing. Okay, I need 
need to figure this out again. Um, I'm just going to show a few patients. Then afterwards, people say, sometimes when you pace proximal to the conduction system, you still have a disease left distally. Mm. So you have a patient left bundle, but also distally there's a different disease, or maybe the same disease, causing a fascicular block. Then they call this um, hot CRT, which is his optimized mm. CRT. You put your RA, you put your his, you look at the ECG, I'm not happy. So you know, yes. put it CS lead. So this is uh, our typical 12-lead um, ECG that we do. We know that this patient has got distal disease, almost 100. Okay. HV, yeah. A HV uh, they're all e EP here, isn't it? Yeah, so it's HV, so distal, basic EP. Basic EP. Yeah. yeah, so basically from the HES, which you can record to the uh, Peckinji fibers, it's taking almost twice the normal conduction system. So there is a disease there. And that one, so from this patient, when we put in the his only, QRS was good, not great, good, particularly coming from 170. So we decided, okay, we're going to put in the lead, LV lead, and you can see the difference from 167 to 143, and we optimize that by putting the lead. Ooh. You can see now ECG looks much better, okay? So the other things you can say, look, maybe for this particular patient, I need the RV lead, I need the CS lead. Now, the question yesterday, if you have a patient, I think Henry asked, when you want a backup system, do you put the RV lead or do you put a CS lead? And we said, look, it's going to depend. If you're doing the conduction system pacing for CRT, CS lead. So if this one dislodges, and that's what I like about stylet driven compared to luminless, then dislodges, you just put it in the RV. Actually, most of the time, even in literature, when it dislodges, it just paces the RV apex. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. It's just your ECG will change, but then treat it like a conventional CRT. Yeah. So those are the things that you could be thinking about is that if I have to put the lid, which one? Obviously, if you're putting it for maybe complete heart block, I don't think it should be expensive and put another guide in the SCS, put his, uh, and then RV apex or septum. So those are the things. Um, this is a patient with, uh, okay, the, set, the next patient, I think the slides are reversed, where we also found that maybe the conduction system, this is before the left bundle, at least for me, um, right bundle, heart failure, conventional, I can't recall, or the QRS was good. So this is still a class 1A, class 4, biventricular pacing. I know it's right, but, but you're already thinking this patient is not going to do well because it's a right bundle. So we say, okay, we're going to do um, his pacing. So we realize that even with the his pacing, it can still work. Once again, I didn't know that with the his pacing, you could correct the right bundle. But if you think about it, if you can correct the right left bundle, you should be able to correct the right bundle. Easier. It the should right be. That is stuck in the yeah. yeah. We always hit it when we place the his caster, when mm. we do talk of the his caster. So to place the right bundle, I think, is much easier than the left bundle. The yeah. Bundle Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that we'll talk about that just now. But yes. So we just said, okay, let's be a bit more organized. Look at the patient. So this is just our algorithm. Okay. I said, okay, all comers. Well, I was. I just. I'm going to do the his final pacing. For CRT, for Brady, AV node ablation uh, uh, subsequently after the uh, implant. Uh, and this is our own algorithm, how you do it. But the most important thing, we took a cut off of three volts. Anything above, it's a failure for me because the capacity of the battery is three. So once you start pacing three and above, you're going to lose probably half of that. So we, we, we did that. Um, we were able to narrow the QRS significantly from one, on average of the 72 patients, not 120, of the 72 from 164 to 130. And the normal one, unfortunately, we increased, but it's not much, but statistically, it's a lot, but it's not much. So, but he told me that if you've got a conduction system uh, pacing for complete heart block, ready pacing, your QRS is still pretty decent, even though it's above that. Uh, 
we had very few patients for um, RV um, only pacing. So even though it's statistically big, but it can't because the patients are like. Well. So I was looking at the QRS narrowing okay. of all comers, and it said for left panel, good results. For uh, normal Brady pacing, we probably sh we should have thought of known about it that. If you're starting with under 100, it's very difficult for you to maintain that. So it's about 110, surgically different though, from the baseline. But for right bundle branch block, we had only about... Of increase, not decrease. Increase, yes, yes, the other way. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. When you're starting with a normal QRS, even in a connection system pacing, at best you can match that, at best. Most of the time you're gonna be on the other side because it's, it's a natural system. But for RV only pacing, right bundle, we had very few patients. This, we didn't. And if you think about non-specific connection system, maybe it's not, maybe it's a muscle disease and not the conduction system. So we're unable to make any change, unable. And I think now also with the connection system pacing, the non-specific conduction delay is probably an exclusion. That will be highly unlikely to make them better because it's probably a myocardial disease primarily, uh, anyway. So this what basically what we had, about 72 patients at the time, male, female distribution. Most of them were for CRT. But for me, that was a problem. We abandoned in the lab 15, 14 patients of the 72. So why? Either because we couldn't narrow we we'll pace to get a heese nicely. When you're pacing, first of all, you have intermittent loss of capture, but that's okay. When you're pacing, it's identical. It's called selective his pacing, but without correction. You're still capturing, it's still the same, but you're not correcting. You know? You're not correcting the left bundle. It means that what, wherever you are pacing, the disease is definitely distal to where you're pacing. So those are the things. Mm. Yeah. So, so I decided to be, let's be critical. So when you look at literature, they say 20% failure rate. But for me, I said, it's not only follow up. I have to include the patient that I failed in the lab. Because if I abandon in the lab, that patient goes to conventional. Follow up, high. So it was 40% for me. Uh, that was too much. Yes, if I only look at those patients who left the lab with a connection system pacing that was successful, it's about 20%, that's fine. But what about those ones in the lab? We still have to consider them as failed, right? So that's when I decided, okay, we're going to go with the left uh, bundle pacing. I'm trying to look at, yeah. So I'm going to move now from his pacing. Uh, okay, the other thing before I move from his pacing, programming. I don't have this slide for programming, but I've got a paper for programming. If you are interested in his bundle pacing, first of all, remember at least 20% of those patients we have to review, uh, revise the lead because of high pacing threshold, even after two years. Programming, the major, major issue is how big is your A when you implant? If you've got a big A, you have over-sensing issues. Actually, not over-sensing, it's over-sensing, over but it's a sensing issue because you, your lead is very proximal to the tricuspid valve and RA. And um, remember the tricuspid leaflet is like this. Yeah, yeah. So you're gonna sense a lot. So always try to get as little A as possible. Then your program is done. Because if you've got a large A, it's almost like T-wave over sensing. You almost always have to revise the lead. Right. Yeah. But programming, we'll, we'll talk about that is later. Is there an optimal ratio between the A and the B? There's no optimal risk that they give you. They just say small a. Okay. <laughs> I haven't come across where the amplitude. Yeah. I, I would say maybe if you sort of like used to EP, one might say, ah, maybe let's push it a little further in, mm -hmm. you know, and get as little a as possible. Which it was. Oh, how
Simultaneous, you said to. Mm. Well, you oh, you already capture the A. Yes, you do. You do. Um, and sometimes, if you don't look carefully, you say uh, when you're pacing, remember I showed the slide when there was a non capture or non correct Yes. So sometimes it looks like a, a non. I'm pressing hard. Oh. Sometimes when you're pacing and you're not correcting, just have to be sure that you're not uh, capturing the AV node. Yeah. So you just, just make, because sometimes it does happen if you're here. We don't see that with the left bundle because it's further in. We're going to talk about that. So because of all those issues for me, uh, high over two years, because we've been following up this patient for two years, a high failure rate has to be called failure rate. So we decided, I decided to go with a left band pacing. So at the moment, I think just about all major companies have got some sort of uh, delivery system. The first one is Medtronic. Medtronic has got Select Secure. Select Secure. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they have a deflectible and a non Medtronic? Oh, oh, Biotronic. Yeah, oh, okay. So it's it's Yes, yeah. Mm. 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 Yes, yeah. So uh, I think you're asking me, so they have a deflectible, but a bit more costly. Um, so, and because of the luminless lead, um, which is what they use for his or conduction system pacing, and the issues we spoke about, I personally decided, let me go with the lead that I'm used to, uh, which is a stylet driven lead. Um, fortunately, we don't have this lead here. <clears throat> But the, the advantage of the left bundle pacing, besides yesterday, <laughs> is the ease with which you pace. First, you don't need a, a, um, an anal um, ECG analyzer in terms of uh, EGMs, but you do need a 12 lead ECG because as you barrel through, and we're going to talk about that, you constantly have to look at that. So I'm going to talk about what I use. So this is like a workhorse of Biotronic. Um, uh, select, Selectra 3D. It's got double caps we were talking about earlier on. So, and it's got um, a dilator. It doesn't come with a wire. So you may need to use an extra wire to get through because this is quite sharp and hard and firm. But what I realized is that the short sheet of the... Oh, that's another thing. Yesterday, I think, um, when you implant, do you guys put in a short sheet for CF? Oh, you do. Yes, yesterday I, uh, I get a feeling that some maybe don't. I always put the short sheet because if I dislodge, I don't have to puncture again. Okay. I have my short sheet. So that short sheet, why it does, even though it doesn't look as long, but it does fit here. So I take out the dilator, leave the, sh leave the sheet in and the wire and thread the wire through the dilator in this. So when you get into the IVC, down to the RA, uh, on the RAO position, so the first thing is to move to anterior structure, which is RV from RA. So you clock, you get, yeah. I generally, when I get to the RA, remove the, um, the dilator because it's quite firm and it's difficult to use that. I'm talking about just how to get to the R uh, RV. It's difficult to get into the RV where the dilator in because it's quite firm. Yeah, it just takes you to IVC, yeah. So wire in. Guide over the wire, clock, get into the RV. Now, yeah. Clock is anterior. 
Yes. Yeah. So the RV is anterior to the. Oh, it's different. It's complete opposite. Yeah. So coming from here, you clock from the RA to the RV. Uh, you counter clock, sorry, from here. But from top, you clock. You clock. Yeah. So again, as you get a bit more experience, you uh, your own pitfalls. So I was just telling them, first patient in Mauritius uh, about I don't know last year. So they said you should you can go once you take out the the dilator can take out the wire and put in the lead. That was the recommendation. But the lead at the time is already prepared. We're gonna talk about it now. What does it mean? The helix is already out. Now think about it, and Biotronic is known for that. You know, even when you're doing normal RV, yeah. it tends to hook more than any other lead. I used to hate it when I started. So you go in from the RA, past the tracker speed valve, you already counter clocking to get to, because you in, it's like in and then out. So I cut the septal leaflets. And obviously you don't see, and there's not much resistance, and then you map, and then, oh, it's good. And then you're trying to screw. Screw doesn't go in, or the lid doesn't go in, and it's well documented now. So one of the reasons why you may not be able to screw in, you have cut the septal leaflet of the tracker speed. Now, if you think that, one thing you should never do is to yank it out. Always then counterclock the whole lead. Or first undo the helix and then counterclock. I didn't do that. One and a half hours. One and a half hours trying to dislodge that. It worked at the, at, at the end. So it's because you just screwed in. So I'm thinking the whole leaflet must have gone through the septum. And then realize, I don't like it, okay? I'm going to move on to another position. So what I do now, I never put the lead in the guide until I'm in the RV. Okay. That's very important. Okay. Mm. So, I, so I take my wire, get into the RV, go as distal as I can, take out the wire, and then map from as distal as possible, moving backwards, rather than mapping so anti -grid. Mm. Yes. You introduced the sheath mm. with the dilator and the guide wire. Yes. You took out the dilator and the guide wire. Oh no no I rem I I leave the, the guide wire in. Yes. So you you go with the sheath and the wire to the, the, wire to the right bend. Yes. Yeah. With the counter clock. Yeah. So I can I know at the time I just leave it. Yeah. You know, yeah. So with the clock and once I'm inside the right ventricle then and now. Yes. And now I'm thinking I'm far from the tracker speed valve. Then I, um, only then I put in the lead. Okay, you are far from the tracker speed valve, then you put in the lead. Put in the lead. Okay, when do you deliver the screw? Okay, so now, um, that was another thing, because I think we all, learn as we, uh, we all learn as we move along. So when I started with uh, Static Driven, which is uh, Solia S60, Solia S60, they didn't talk about preparing the lead. All they said is just take out the screw. But then the physiology of the lead, even though it wasn't designed for this, the, the biotronic at least, so it's got um, uh, the, the inner and the outer uh, fibers that keep the lead tense because you need the lead to be tense. All right. So when you take out the helix as usual, that's the inner fibers that make the lead tense. And then there is that, I call it a thing of magic, uh, the green tool at the end of the lead. What do you call it? They, even in the paper, they call it the green tool. Oh, we showed the paper yesterday, yeah? Right at the end of the lead. So the green thing. Uh, we, they call them the green, the green thing. No, at the end of the lead? But you know what I'm talking about. So the lead, so it's... it's it's easier for you to pass in the wire in it if it's there at the end of the lid. Now, it doesn't have a name because I went Google it. It's called the green thing. So I thought maybe you know. So, but at the end of the lid, you know, Mohammed? So, yeah. So you, you take it out first and you undo the pin with a normal turning tool. Four to eight times, this, the helix will be out. All right? And then you put it back in so you know it works and then you put it inside the guide. Now your guide is in the RV already. 
So on the floater, I make sure that I don't go to the, at the I just go towards the tip, not beyond the tip. And then do the same thing. So I know at four or five turns, the helix is going to be out. Then I take the green thing, and then you turn it about eight times as well. So you tension the lead. So if you do that before and after, you realize when you put the lead, take the lead, and put it against your hand, it's soft. Right? You do those two maneuvers, taking out the helix and the green thing. You're going to call it a green tool. The lead is firmer. It's not as flimsy as this. So it means that it's ready to be battled through the septum. So once you're ready, and then you counter, then you, then you counter clock. Oh, yeah, you leave it on. And how many turns? With the game? Eight turns. Eight. Eight turns. Oh, thank you very much. No, you keep it in. No, no, so when you turn, you do your eight turns, don't remove it. As soon as you remove it, you lose the tension. Yeah. You don't have the lead that you can use? Old lead? I, for me, I find it to be very important because initially we were doing subtle pacing because we are not really getting good. I said, no, 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 this lead, you need to tension it. You need to tension Also, before you do that, so there's what you call, it doesn't have a name, Prof. I want to Google it. So at the end of the lead, it's called a green thing. Mm. Yeah, it's called a green. The green one, the green tip, the green yeah. The ex, uh, connection. Yeah, the green which accessory. We, the green accessory. So with that, it's the now the outer part of the, of the tensioning mechanism. So you do that clockwise as well, eight times. And, and keep it there. I saw you uh, doing this uh, in the cath lab for, uh, as lead preparation. Yes, lead preparation. We used to do this before when we were have this screw in lead, but we stopped because uh, John Onifer said, who said it's not going to come back, come out? So we stopped doing this maybe someone who had me 20 years ago. And had <laughs> I also never did. Yeah, so. I never did. It's only now that you're doing it. Apparently, yeah. it's very important. Yeah. And also, the green thing is not only for the tension of the lid to be firmer, mm -hmm. but if you don't, and I saw you this last week when I was doing this, I think the green thing came out in front of my eyes because we've mapped, you screwed in, you do your, your second injection to see how deep the lid is, you see the helix coming back. Oh. Coming back. So, yeah, it's retract. So the green so thing the does, the yeah, yeah. So the green thing does two things. It's like it, a doctor, yeah? Yes, yeah. It keeps it in, firm. So it keeps it firm, and it keeps the stylet extended. The only time you take it out is when you're happy with everything. So stylet also must always, so lip preparation, I think, is more. The stylet must always be right to the end of the lid. So you're talking about stylet. So it has to be right at the end of the lid. So those are the three things probably for me very important in preparation. And personal experience, don't um, advance the lead beyond the uh, don't advance the lead beyond the tip of the guide before you cross over to the uh, to the RV because you can keep yeah because you the, the, the yes and that can be a nightmare. It's now well documented. So once we have all of this, then your assistant a gentle clock counterclockwise. Gentle counterclockwise. The, the, the ship. The ship. Yeah. Keep it over the septum. Yes. And then you do your septogram. All right. Um, I was hoping we were going to play. Say it. Yeah. Um, um, I have it in my laptop. Um, yeah, yes, laptop. You know, why you so there are two subtrograms that you're going to do. You're going to do a subtrogram to make sure that, uh, thanks, to make sure that the guide is right up against the septum, and you're going to do the second subtrogram to see if you battled through the septum. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, you took the yeah. Uh, okay. 
just want to show you something so quickly. I won't be long. So this is the, the case I, I was telling you, I sent to you. So this will be your first septogram in the LAO, about 25. Your lead will be here, right before you borrow through. You know you're in the septum. If you're injecting it down, you don't see a, a nice veil up there, so then you're not close. Then you push a bit further or you counterclock, whatever you think is gonna take you to the septum, until you see this. And then you borrow through to see if the lid is in. This lid is in, you can see, once you put in the die, so this select, Selectra 3D has this port. So you can either put it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, flash and die. Yeah. Very important flash because the lead can be yeah, the die. So you can put a three way tap or you can put um, a lua lock. So it's very, very important. So that's a septogram that you do. Mouse. Hey, Mohammed, thank you. Oh, I've got the wrong presentation there. before I recognize my slide, but I have to jump through so. Okay, so um, this was a concept of the predestined fibers. If you think about it, so this fiber, if it's going to be a left bundle, it's always going to be the left bundle, even if it's in the AV node. So we've got a disease here, distally, that disease is going to manifest. It's not entanglement like that. I just wanted to see, show you that. Um, is it possible? Now and again, I think I need you to, for manual. Anyway, so while he's getting me to be able to move this slide, Ali. so, so I'm, Ali. Mm, the previous slide. Okay. I'm pressing hard. So the lead preparation, septogram, and you also need someone to, to hold the guide for you. Okay. Is it working now? Uh, yeah. A second slide. I don't need to talk about this, please. We, we already spoken about this. this is what I draw about. Yeah. This is what I drew myself trying to understand. Fibrous tissue, we're gonna get selective pacing only. Small R wave, almost always small R wave. Beautiful ECG, bad problems. Yes. Not so good ECG, but better because you wanna capture the myocardium. Okay, it's wrapped around it. Um, Uh, so can I just do? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. I am oh, how come again? Okay. I think this is when, when you are not using the mouse for a long time, yeah. you go to sleep. Oh, go to sleep. Go to sleep. Just do like this. Press mm. and scroll. I'll press and scroll. Okay. So for those who have used um, his bundle pacing, you know, all you need to have in mind, and again, maybe easier said than done, is have an idea where the his is at. And it's only about one, one or two centimeters distal to that. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So the, the, the left bundle pacing, the concept is that the left bundle is not that far from the RV side. If you, if you think about it. But before you, you process that, there's just, there's just no way you're going to get it, you know, by, by borrowing into the septum. And how come it's, it's a bit more successful than his? It's because you don't know where the main bundle is at. If you miss that, you can still paste the posterior septal or, or fascicle 
or anterior fascicle, the results are the same because if you activate one part of the conduction system, it's going to fan out and activate the left bundle almost instantaneously. And we're talking about how can the left bundle correct the right bundle branch block because it can, right? Um, there are different mechanisms that people have thought about. One is just the physiology and anatomy of the conduction system is that it's still connected. So if you're pacing, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to quickly go through this because this is just theory. I don't think we need theory. But there's evidence that uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this because this is just for your references that it appeared to work. Actually, I think I gave you the wrong presentation. <laughs> okay, while we're having coffee, quickly. Um, because the other one is a bit more organized. A little bit, yes, a little bit, just a little bit. Like this morning? No, no. It's <laughs> I had another one, let me see. Uh, so this morning, I was it's reorganizing my slide. It's the same thing, but just reorganizing my slide. We, uh, now we are uh, waiting for questions until we get ready with the cases. Uh, we have Dr. Samha from uh, National Heart Institute. She has a question. What is your question, Samha? Um, uh, looking for the shape of the cheese guiding the, uh, the lead, um, does it um, make that suggestion to reshape a stylet like that to gain the septal position? to acquire more benefits in the conventional usual way. Very nice question for you, okay. Dr. So I might as well address that. Sorry, sir. Uh, did you get the, uh, the question? Can we not use the sheath as shape, but use a style as shape? As she asked me. So my personal experience, so again, I shared this experience with uh, a couple of weeks ago. This was by accident. So I don't know if I can do it again, right? So, so the question is, can we get to the conduction system using just a stylet? That's a question. But this is what they started. When they started uh, doing the, his bundle pacing, they were shaping the stylet in this S shape to go there and to catch the hiss. This is the first trial. Then they asked the companies to prepare a preformed shape, which is like an S-like with a big curve and this S at the, at the end, in order to help the lead to reach the hiss bundle end. So this is the beginning. So the preformed shape. Also, there are some deflective sheets which, which I saw, uh, which with steerable sheets where you can Move the sheath to the turkas bed, make it clockwise, counterclockwise, in order to reach the area where you want. I think the future will be to these deflectable sheaths, like the deflectable yeah. catheters, which will help us map the whole septum because the anatomy of the patient is not the same, especially those with dilated heart. Remember that the CS anatomy is easy, EPS, mm. but when you go for a CRT with a heart failure, you find that the right atrium is huge. The CS is delivered down. 
is pushed down. You cannot imagine this the same in the conductive system. The septum is moved. Remember the patient yesterday? Yes. He had like a cave, a pouch in the septum. So this is why the technology should keep tracking of our needs. And this is what they do in the big, company, big uh, countries like America or Germany, where Egypt. the doctors tell them what they need. They go to the uh, uh, factory. They because invent, they, 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 yeah. yes. If they come to us, they will find a lot of ideas. But where is your publication? We spoke about this this morning, publication. <laughs> We need young people to help us. So, um, you, you have been answered. But for left bundle, I think it will be difficult to use a stylet only. Yeah. Because not only that, you need to shape it so that you can get to it, but you need to borrow through the septum. Now, if you're using a lid alone, it's almost impossible yeah, to get to that. But, so, uh, I don't have a date on this one. Um, so this is a patient who came uh, with a left bundle branch block. I'm doing my usual left bundle uh, pacing. Uh, what I often do, oh, that's another thing I forgot to mention. So if I've got a left bundle branch block, just like when you're doing the heels, I always put the RA catheter into the RV as a backup system. Because you, yeah, backup pacing, because you're bound to bump the right bundle. Sometimes you come back after two minutes, sometimes an hour or the following day, so you never know. Because right bundle is very superficial. So you can get to the right bundle, but left bundle, I don't think so. So what happened here is uh, I bumped it, complete hot block, and at the time, for whatever reason, the RV, the RA wasn't pacing. Because I usually, that's another thing I learned, I usually don't screw it in, I just push it there and pace, even if it's five, it's fine. And then when I needed to pace, it wasn't pacing. I have my lead to get to the left bundle. So I'm waiting, I'm waiting. So I'm pacing from my RV lead. I'm pacing. And when I'm pacing RV lead, the one that I was intended to go with it. So I realized, oh, there is a right bundle there where I found it. So I, mentally, I thought, okay, it's there. Eventually, it came back. I did my left bundle. The ECG looked nice, but I said, okay, I'm left with the residual right bundle branch block. Yes, it's narrow, it's beautiful, but can I then paste the right bundle just to see? So I decided I know it is, so I took a stylet to come into your question, curved it, went back to that spot, and pasted that. So when I pasted it alone, I got a, right, a left bundle again. So I got the right bundle, which was similar to that, but narrower, slightly narrower. I don't know why. Yeah, maybe it's further down as well. It was narrow but left bundle. So I said, okay, let me paste both. Ah, it, it's not clear. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. From that. Yes, yeah. Right. yeah. So we end up pacing the right bundle, the left bundle. And that's another thing. So the right bundle is, if you think about it, you think the right bundle is lower down. So this will be the LAO. This is the RAO projection, right? So you would, anatomically, you'll think the right bundle is probably louder. No, right bundle is slightly above. So it goes like this. The left bundle goes just underneath yeah. the fibrous membrane of, yeah. the, of the septum. So it's gonna, be, it's gonna be somewhere down there. So I, then I, I'm, look, I'm still looking for someone to help me publish it, but I also spoke to Ajijola, yeah. because there was no one in the literature that I knew who did by bundle pacing. So I call it the by bundle pacing. Because we have uh, Amira, you have Gandhi, mm. you have Hani, mm. you have Salami, no, yeah. you have Hadid, you have Shireen, choose one. We we'll make a toast. I think I'll try I think I'll go with the Alexandria first. <laughs> from what you've told me. I won't I won't tell you what Prof told me. Uh, but I think I'll go with the Alexandria first. <laughs> it's obviously great. But let's just go back. Um, so I gave him the wrong presentation, but it's the same slide. It's just I didn't organize them the way I want. So, but please do ask me questions while we're going about. We so you asked me about. So this is all his pacing. 
this is all his pacing. So we also use his pacing in a patient with, um, I've never seen that before, PR of 500. Yeah, yeah. With, can you imagine what kind of MR? Diastolic MR. Because if you think about it, yeah, taking so long for the connection to get into the ventricle. They get diastolic MR with such a long PR interval sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So, so he's pacing only. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we spoke about this yesterday in the absent. So it looks like dissection. So this is a patient who came um, because the CRT had failed. So we said, okay, ah, CRT, CRT, I'm going to do this, you know because I've been doing this for some time, you think you know everything. So, but the advantage <clears throat> is I always use the flotation balloon. I always start at the bottom. You can see I'm not, it's, so this part is the true uh, coronal sinus. This is the greater kind of vein. So that's a, also a question that gets asked a lot in EP. So it, where it narrows, that's where it changes. Okay, so you can see, doesn't look like anything. I go up, doesn't look like anything. So this patient had a pericarditis. I don't know whether it's TB or uremic. So all the veins are gone. So you're sitting with this patient, you're trying to find a vein to put in a lid, you can see the whole day. So for me, after two minutes of venogram, I have to think, is it epicardial approach or is it left bundle pacing? So we went with, uh, I think we're still doing his pacing for this patient. So we did his pacing for this patient. So um, in those areas where you really can't do anything about it, it, look, it does look like dissection. But before we, we took a picture, we saw this. And said, oh, OK, must be um, you know, cas classification of the pericardium and epicardium mm -hmm. from pericarditis, the old pericarditis. No constructive pericarditis symptoms, which is yeah, almost like an incidental. So for me, just about everyone who needs pacing for now, I may have to revise it like I did with his, I go with the left band pacing. And also, the other thing I didn't tell you, I forgot to tell you. So you remember in my um, study that we were, even patients who were coming for AV node ablation, we, we will, so, so someone who's planned for AV node ablation, we put in um, permanent AF, we put one his pacing, and then they come back for AV node ablation. It's not much between the, a, the true AV node and the his. Already, and already before you bought his pacing. Yes, two weeks. They come back after two weeks. That's what I do. Put in the pacemaker two weeks. They come back. I'm happy. Pacing threshold, good on that particular day. Turn on the RF. Halas. No, no V. No V. No pacing. No pacing. Could be, yes, yes, but, um, but also remember, it's, it's usually very difficult to ablate the, the his because it's in the fibrous tissue, it's sort of like connected, but it's possible. But you know what? Yeah. I have problems to ablate mm. the ablate. Mm. When we, actually, in many cases, mm. when we were planning for epinode ablation, I said, how come? What is the antiseptic? Yes. Yeah. I go, and you got, so I have to go meet septic. Yeah. And when Get it, boom. boom. Everything. Yes, yeah. So this is probably hit. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah. One is that the other one is lead damage from the RF so because of the proximity. Yeah. 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 Because sometimes, you know, I struggle to get the AV node. I'm like 40 watts, 50 watts, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go home. Everyone who is an EP doesn't want to do AV node ablation, yeah. you know. Yeah. So you want to get out of that lab before your friends come. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so 40 watts. Flat line, the lead, full on recess. That's the day I decided, okay, lead revision is high. AV node, definitely, we said we, we move from AV. If you're going to do AV node, we went back to RV apical pacing. Um, but now we're slowly moving back to uh, left bundle. We have done uh, three AV node ablations with the left bundle pacing with no issues. But he's got to be careful because if you're going to do his pacing, and you're going to be ablating in two weeks' time. Either you abla I ablated the his, or you damage the lid. But After ablation, you always have, have to. To, read the, uh, to uh, interrogate the device and see the impedance. If you damage the lid, your impedance will have changed. 
It did. That's why I know. That's why I know I, um, I damaged the lid. Generally, when you do ablation, yeah. even if you ablate, they say you must always interrogate the device after yeah. the ablation, if yeah. you start whatever it is, lead dislodgement, micro dislodgement, you may or may not see. So for me, that was another reason. His pacing maybe not for this patient. Personally, definitely, I went back to RVA Apex, but now with the left bundle pacing, we're pretty far when you're going to ab ab ablate. Of the 35 patients we've done, we had two dislodgements. So it's not unheard of. Left bundle? Yes. Yeah. Two lead dislodgements. Um, which is, if, but no, most important thing, none of the patients have come back. It's early days. We only started doing this last year, September, routinely. We haven't had sepsis. We haven't had a um, high patient threshold over a period of time. But lead dislodgement is not unheard of. But regarding immunode ablation uh, mm. with his pacing, you mm. did uh, his pacing before immunode ablation. Yes. You did uh, what, what is the result of the reverse? You mm. do immunode ablation and after that you. Put no, after that, they were. No, no, no. The same time. At the same, same time. time, yes. Actually, you, you had to do this uh, for the last case in uh, way. I implanted the device here. Mm. I implanted the device and then I went. But that was CRT. Mm -hmm. CRT. Yeah. RV, mm -hmm. RV and CRT, CSV, RV lead, and immunodepression. Yeah, so if I'm going to put in two leads, if I'm going to put in two leads, we do it at the same time. Yes, yes, but same if, time. Yeah, yes. But if I'm going to have one lead, like RV lead only, it's permanent AF, no RA lead, mm -hmm. if I'm going to have one lead, I wait two weeks. Those are the guidelines. But you have to I wait. Mm, yeah, you have to wait two weeks to make sure that lead is stable. Patient threshold because even with the RV apex pacing, you can still perforate, can yeah. patient threshold high, dislodge. Yeah. So I'm very afraid of doing both procedures at the same time with one lead. Mm. I'd rather wait two weeks. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, is the lead uh, in left bundle pacing uh, stable with the, the, the cases that have huge dilatation, the right side, and severe uh, mitral regurgitation, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, do, you, do you think this, uh, this lead will be a stable lead in this position, or do you have issues? Yes. So for people who have followed maybe longer than me, because okay. for people who have followed longer than me, they report that they say, uh, and I've got the papers where they look at stability of RV apical pacing versus left bundle. It's similar. Similar. So which means that even though I haven't had maybe pulmonary hypertension, tucker speed breakage, severely dilated RV, it appears that the stability of the left bundle pacing is similar to RV pacing, which cannot be said for his pacing. So other than perforation, if you, if you miss it, um, and maybe dislodgement, um, I don't know what's the percentage, uh, two of uh, 35, uh, that's like five, five, three? Five, six, yeah. yeah. So um, maybe as we do more and more, it's fine. And also with, with all the left bundle pacing, when they dislodge, they don't go to the atrium. They go to the RV. So you're okay. Yeah, so you're okay. You don't even have to. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the two that I had, they dislodge into the RV. Uh, so we look at the ECG. That's not left bundle pacing. Uh, we interrogate. You know, it's capturing, but capturing RV, do x ray, it's in the RV. Still capturing. Yeah, still capturing. Obviously, if it was for CRT, without the LV lead, then you have to decide, do you go and put in the CS, mm -hmm. or do you go and try again? I don't have an answer. Uh, I try to push the envelope a little bit. So what I think I will do, is do, do again, yeah. But probably what I'll do is because, oh, where's the guy from Metro Biotronic? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's green. So, oh, green. Green, yeah, green thing. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm Brian, what's your name? I'm on. Mohamed. Mohamed. 
Movement. 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 Yeah. So we, 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 we do quite a bit of devices now with one coming. I used to do Medtronic almost only, but I, I, I realized that to negotiate is difficult. So if you use them only, negotiate. Like now they gave me six guides, six leads for free. You know, because it's like, okay, if you don't do that, I'm going to use someone else, right? So <clears throat> in that case, let's say it dislodges, then you can uh, I tell the company, you know, it's not the patient's fault. Uh, I should have maybe gone with conventional, so they don't have to pay for the next lead. I just say, okay, I'm going to CS. But that's the thing that I like about left band is that even when it dislodged, which is 3%, Five percent. Um, it's going to go into the RV. Now it depends on the original indication. What was it for? If it was for Brady pacing, leave it alone. If it was for CRT, yeah. But I think at the beginning, uh, maybe your first ten cases, um, it's always better to have some sort of backup system. I think we spoke about that yesterday. Um, if it's for CRT, maybe put the CS and the left bundle. If it's for a complete heart block, left bundle and RV as, as a backup. Because it might dislodge into the RA and then you don't have a backup. Mm -hmm. No, so depending on the indication, say the indication for pacing from the beginning was a CRT. Instead of having RA in a left bundle only, you can have RA, left bundle, and a CS. If it was for complete heart block, RA, left bundle, and RV, just so that if it does dislodge, you, you have a backup. Um, do you have questions on this? This is slides I wanted to show. So we spoke yesterday and said, no. So the first patient we got in, and it was, we knew that it was not left money patient. So how do you know it's not left money patient? So, okay, when you go and we going back now to techniques. So septogram, in the septum, you, you deliver, you screw it in, you do a second septogram. As we saw there, it's inside, no perforation, and you pace. So the first thing you're looking for is the right bundle. So it must have a right bundle. You're pacing, remember, you're only pacing unipolar because the anode is inside the guide. You're pacing that, and you see that. But <clears throat> having a right bundle doesn't make it, doesn't necessarily make it uh, a left bundle pacing. So, for instance, uh, you might see notching um, in the other slide that I will show you just now. Um, can you see, I'm not sure if you can see that there's more notching here yeah, and slightly wider. It looks good, but if you have notching, I've got, I'll show you the other slide. Let me see. Sorry, I, I, I gave him the wrong slide, but I want to show you the difference between I'll yeah. show you. Yeah. So you can't see. That. But if you see notching in V4, 5, and 6, it means it's septal pacing. Even if you have a right band branch morphology. Why notching? It means that you're not engaging the conduction system directly. You're pacing one chamber and then the next picture. Because notching, notching means that, just a delay in conduction. So you, you're pacing the RV and the LV, or you're pacing the LV and the RV. So you're not supposed to see notching. So this, I have to give you, a, his, his name is Marek. He's probably written more. Marek Jabrensky, I'll give you the name. More outside China, because this is a Chinese technology. Um, and by the way, the left bundle was accidental. When mm -hmm. they, they were looking for distal heat spacing, and they end up in the left bundle. So most of the experience is in China. And outside China, this guy called um, um, Marek Jabrensky. So it's coming up with all these um, criteria, criteria for, thanks. It's coming up with this criteria to say is a left bundle. One is notching. Two is you paste this from the okay, spike. What, what, what is the notch? Where do you look at the notch? V4, 5, and 6. Where? Yeah, on the precordial lid. I know, that, that, uh, oh, oh. ascending or descending? Yeah. Oh, when, when you see it. Yeah, yeah. It should be a spike up and down. I, I, I still have to look for my other presentation, okay. but I'll show it to you. Yeah, but notching. One is notching. If you see notching, okay. so V4, where, 5, and 6. This one doesn't show. That's okay. why I want to show you. 
Yeah. So if you don't see notching, right bundle, no notching, you there. And then you put a pacing spike mm -hmm. to the peak of the RV. Okay. If it's less than 80, what does it mean? It usually means that you're in the left bundle. Why 80? Because if you look at one of the criterion of left bundle branch block, LBBB, is intrinsic deflection in V5 or 6. If it's more than 70, it means that the patient has early left bundle branch before you even see any morphological changes. Yeah. Now, why the pacing spark? The pacing spark, if you think about it, if you're in the left bundle area, you would be showing the left bundle spark, like the his spark, the right bundle spark. So it takes about 30, 50 milliseconds to get into the Purkinje fibers, to get into the endomyocardium. So that number comes from there. But other people say no. If you have an isoelectric, that's why it's changing all the time. If you see isoelectric line here, you must omit that isoelectric line. Rather, move from here to the spark. So yesterday, when we measured from the spike to V5 or 6, must always use V5 or 6. Why? It's more directly to the LV. Yeah. So we, from here to here, we got measuring, hundreds and the peak. The Yeah, that's why I said peak, peak all the time. So from here to here, we're getting about 100, 115. But when we pace from the onset of the QRS to here, it was like 60. So there are those people say, measure from the spike, to the peak, or this guy Chopransky says no. Measure from the onset of the QRS, particularly if there is that isoelectric line. So at the moment, I don't know what to measure. So I measure where it makes me feel good. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because. But that's the day. Mm. 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 This is Dr. Sharif Habib. Uh, you're happy with the place, and the readings were okay. But on the floor, uh, the anode uh, was inside the septum. Was not inside the septum. No, you, you decided to get it outside a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so fluoroscopy, uh, what is the guide? Uh, either uh, the anode uh, is fully inside the septum or partly outside. How can I control? Yeah, thanks. So Prof. Merit had already told us that patient had hypertro uh, hypertrophic uh, hypertrophic uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Left yeah, it was left ventricular hypertrophy. Yes. So I'm already thinking normal septum, 8, 10, 11 millimeters yes. at most. Plus 17. Yes. So uh, from the helix to the anode of the lead is 10 millimeters. So I'm thinking if my anode is on the other side of the septogram wall, so I'm only having like 8 millimeters in. So even though we're seeing something good, probably is not left bundle. It's probably uh, septum because my helix must be, if the patient has LVH, it must be far. So I decided to screw further in. Normal, yeah. Oh, yeah, because you never know that septum. It might be maybe seven there, maybe down, might be sleeping more, but still within normal. So you don't really go with the inode. I went with the inode because I, she had already told me, Prof, that it was hypertrophy. So I said, you know what, let me just go a little bit deep in. But then with that, um, I'm not sure if you saw, but I we discussed, you saw it, yeah. So perforation. So yeah. did you see the perforation? Yeah. So I said, guys, so I was with Anwar and, uh, Anwar and Salah. And Salah. So I said, no, let's move the position. I didn't tell them the perforation, I said, I'll tell them afterwards. <laughs> so we moved it to a different position. Yeah. 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 We have the film, you can revise it as yeah. you want to so when you do septogram, you always want to look for that as well. So, so the measurement, so let's just go, so versus um, left, bunt, left bundle branch pacing versus left ventricular septum, no notching. QRS must be right uh, bundle branch block. And the other one, which I think is easy, easy to remember, I'm not sure it's gonna stay, is what you call interpeak. Now, if you're pacing the RV, you're expecting the peak of the V6 to be earlier than the peak looking at the right side of the heart. So V6, if you take that peak to that peak, it should not be less than 40 milliseconds. So you just put a spike on the V6 peak and move it to the RV 
peak in V1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so if it's 10, you know you are doing septal pacing, not the other. I think it's easy to remember that. Mm. From two, so, the so the B2. concept. So V1 is looking at the RV, V6 looking at the LV. So if you really are pacing the left bundle, you should be seeing any depolarization of the LV compared to the RV. Yeah. Hence, right bundle mm. morphology. So it means that the peak of V6 must be earlier than peak of V1. Yes. And that number is 40 and above. Anything less than that, you're not really in the right area. Nice. But now other people are thinking, are they, these things all necessary if You've got a QRS of under 130, definitely if it's under 120, right bundle branch morphology, no notching. So these are the things that if you're really interested in, you can talk about, I mean, you can look for, but by and large, QRS narrow, less than 130, depending where you're starting from, uh, right bundle branch morphology, the lead is stable, septogram, there's no perforation, God. So in terms of the inode, I don't really look. I did that yesterday only because I had this information that this patient had a huge left septum. So I thought there's no way from the helix tip to the inode, which is 10 millimeters, I'm going to be on the left side of the septum. That's why. Yes. And when you change the position? Oh, that's coming for. Okay, fine. When you change the, uh, the size of the, of the lead, mm -hmm. you, you, we got it out and we go to another side. When you do injection, we find there is a uh, dye is, is coming inside the place, the previous place. So is this okay or not? I don't, I, I mean, is this considered perforation or is, is it acceptable that uh, there is a groove inside the septum when we change I, the position? So for me, if I see a perforation, if, sorry, sorry. If I see the perforation, I want to change the size. For two reasons. Even if it's small perforation. I mean, what is the meaning of perforation? Oh. oh, so the dye. You can only see it with the dye. Or unless you're using ice, uh, intracardiac echocardiogram, or uh, TOE. Yeah, yeah. But with the echo, you have to be very good because it's, you're looking at the helix, not the whole lead. Yeah. So, but the dye is perfect. Yeah, dye is perfect. <laughs> uh, perforation? means your helix is looking at the left ventricle endocardia. So there is a risk of thrombus. There is a risk of low, no capture. So because the helix, the, 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 the helix is, is perforating to the cavity of the left ventricle. You don't want any metal in the left ventricle. Okay? I read this. Yes. And, and also you're running a risk that your measurements and everything could be good on that particular day. And now we're talking about the slack. So if you're already leaving the lead with a perforation, there is a good chance that two things might happen. It might dislodge or it might go further in. Yeah. 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 Particularly if your slack is too much. So now we're talking about the slack. What is a good slack? What is not good slack? Um, I just look at, yeah. So for me, now that I do this, this is, these are not my slides. I would have considered this too much slack. But it's supposed to be uh, Yeah. Uh, in the LAO. RAO towards one o'clock, that's fine. So your slack mainly you'll be able to see better in the LAO. So I would leave this up. Apparently when you've got too much slack, or again, very few patients, they see more perforation. And it makes sense because you've got this pressure pushing yeah. the lid down and then because it can't go down, that is transmitted to the lid and then can go. So if I'm leaving with small perforation and I think it's fine, Maybe it will be okay, but don't be surprised if come the following days, full on perforation. That's one. Two other things that Prof is talking about, pacing parameters. Now, what will make you think there's a perforation without a septogram? Because other people don't do septogram, even though it's recommended to do septogram, is that if your impedance is absolutely below 300, below 400, think about it, definitely under uh, 200. And it makes sense because the helix is just hanging in the endocardium of the LV. Mm -hmm. So, um, and again, you, <clears throat> I don't do this myself, but as you screw it in, you're supposed to, by other people, you're supposed to check your pacing impedance. It goes up, and that's understandable, and it goes down by about 200. If it goes down by more than that, I feel that there are too many numbers to remember, I don't do that. At the end, 
if my pacing impedance is 200 and 200, I'm probably perforated, all right? So I'll move the lid, even if the septocrine doesn't show that. But I, would, I wouldn't want to leave it if I think I've perforated, because that lid is not stable. Yeah. Also, the, the point they make is that just moving the lid back is not good enough. Because you, you, you're tempted to say, let me just move the lid back. Syndrome, which is the uh, infiltrative cardiomyopathy, uh, autosomal, uh, uh, X-linked, X-linked, Yala uh, Ruha with some mental retardation and infiltrative myocardium with hypertrophy. And he has conductive system affection, he has atrial fibrillation, uh, scape rhythm slow, ventricular response, uh, 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 conduction, and right bundle. So um, for him, a CRTD is a, is a classic. But because we don't have this budget, we got him donation with pacing. Pacing only, not defibrillator. But defibrillator may be later on if he gets syncope or VT or this is his destiny. So we decided to give him dual chamber pacemaker because of his AFib and the left atrium is huge. So we said, OK, we'll go for dual chamber pacemaker, RV pacing, and left bundle area pacing because his ejection fraction is 30%. So uh, this is Dr. Uh, Brian. He's going to explain what he did. Placing the RV lead first and go. Yeah, so as, as we do the left bundle, the, the first projection is RAO for me at least. The floor is not open. If Zoom. We are seeing it and it's from Zoom. Ali. سيبك مدلة لا ما هو أنا داخلة بالاثنين أكاونت بقى مالكش دعوة الفلورو باين يا نبيل نبيل أخش على ال... أنور بيقول الفلورو باين يبقى باين خلاص أوكي أعمل الأكاونت الثاني يا بولبول يلا جو أهيد so as I was saying, so we have uh, RAO projection as a preferred view uh, to get from RA to the RV. So as you're going down here, um, I don't think we have that floor. We'll be going to get it to RA, take out the dilator, leave the guide and the wire, then uh, clockwise into the RV. Um, and once in the RV, beyond the tricuspid valve uh, anatomically, then introduce the lead and you prepare the lid inside, you've been through how you prepare a lid. And then from here, uh, can you show us the next one? So ideally, ideally, it should look at about one o'clock, so we don't have that. Can you go back to the RAO? RAO? So ideally, your guide probably is gonna be somewhere here. So you already, you know, your heels is gonna be somewhere. So, yeah, so it's gonna be, if you take this as a clock, it's gonna to be towards one o'clock. Yeah, generally. A review, yeah. 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 Again, okay, next one. Next. Oh, can you do that? Oh, yeah, point. Yeah, on the LAO, we do our first septogram to make sure we write against the septum. Um, and we can see here the guide is right next to the septum. The lid is just outside with the helix on zoom. You can, check, you can have a look at that. But at least we know we write against the septum. So we're ready now with them as the assistant, making sure a gently counterclock, and the other one is delivering the lead. Now the lead to deliver it is rapid, a clockwise movement, preferably on the LAO projection, without letting go. Quick, after six, seven, or eight, ten, then you let go and you test. You test with the septogram. Oh, you can test with the 12 lead ECG. Yeah. Ideally, it would be nice to have V1, AVL, and AVR in good position because those are the ones that tell you are you in a good space. So as we said earlier on, at the beginning, it's almost like a W pattern. Eight out of 10 patients, 80%, not everyone. Um, AVL, as you can think about it, should be <clears throat> positive. AVR negative. You're pacing away from the RV. Yeah. So as you can see, and the mouse here, uh, that we're not inside the septum. We're hoping to be in this area. 
ideally between two, three, and maybe four, but most of the time pointing here. Also, if you take this as a clock on the wall, yeah, it's 12, six, three. Yeah. So this is three, two. So almost horizontal. Sometimes it look up, but almost horizontal. Sometimes it does go this way, sometimes this way. But this is the area of interest. Obviously, if it perpendicular, this here is not. Down is not. So we've done our septogram. We're borrowing the next, um, the next one. Oh, oh okay. Um, we didn't see. Okay, you can see now it's probably inside. You can see because the left subtogram that we did earlier on, it was right against that. But we still have to do it. Now, we also know that it's probably inside because look at the guide. So generally, when you screw in the lid, make sure the guide doesn't come back. Mm -hmm. so, back. so here it's back, but I'm not sure if the sequence of events. Where, but you can see this lid. It must be in because the guide is back. The stylet is still in. You remember we said when we are about to, uh, to dissect, to take out the, the guide, we pull back the stylet about 10 centimeters because if you leave the stylet in before slitting the guide, chances are it's going to dislodge because on the RAO position is looking up. The stylet is in and straight. So it's supported by the guide. As soon as you take the guide out without pulling the stylet first, it tends to dislodge. So the thing is that take out the stylet about 10 centimeters and then hold the lead and pull back the guide. So here, you still have the stylet in, I think. The guide is back. Yeah. This lead should be somewhere here. So it means that you're in. Mm -hmm. But that's not an ideal position for septogram because we need a septogram. Can you show us the next one? So doing septogram, you're looking for two things. Okay, we realize, okay, the next one. Next one? Next. Wait, oh, 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 no, no, oh, the previous one, the previous one, the previous one. So you can see here yeah, we screwed. We're in the other side of the vertebrae, but when you do a septogram, it's only the helix that is in. Only. So we do our next sequence. Four, five, six, screwing, holding the guide fast and on. So I tend to do both hands, so I don't let go in between. The next one, next one, next. yeah. So we did this. Okay, pre the one we just played now. This one, yeah. Stop there, yeah. This one, yeah. So you can see nice if it, the lid is in, right? So under normal circumstances, if everything is fine, I leave it here. But now, I said to myself, it's got hypertrophy. The anode is on the other side, just on the other side. So that's the question you were, you were asking Sharif, right? So play the septogram. This one, the current one, please play. You see, there's nothing coming in here. It's good. No preparation. So I decided, okay, hypertrophy, let me move more. So Arno and I, did more. The next one? Next one? Okay. So, yeah. No, you went back. Yeah. The next one, where the lead? Yeah. yeah. So we saw that. So this is, sometimes when you do a transeptal puncture with the nail, you do that. You don't see tenting. It doesn't worry me. It's all contained. It's not going anywhere. It's just, so just move back. No, it's just like dissection. Dissection. Okay. Next one? Next one? Yeah. Now look at this. So we push further in two things. We can see we much further in. I think the thickness of the septum is seen here. Look mm. at this. Yes. Yeah. But look, so the anode, it's inside, inside. the yeah. Yeah. not just the anode, even the proximal part of the of the lead. Yeah. This part. Look at two. Yeah. This part. Yeah. And now, so you're looking at septicum, it's fine. But if, just follow here. Yeah. yeah. Can you see this? That's perforation. Really? Yeah, I'll show you. There, there's perforation. Hey. There, oh, you can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was with Anna. I just said, no, I don't like this position. Let's move. All right. So there's perforation. There's perforation, yeah. But it's very faint. So we move. So clearly, moving this from here to here, 
just that spacing of maybe four millimeters or something like that. Cost per, that was definitely, I think this is definitely perforation. I don't, yeah. yeah. Because it's at the jet, at the tip. Next one. We didn't do subtracram yet, did we? There's a bit of a die here. So at the end, you always want to look towards, I'm not sure if the fi this is the final one, though. No, this, I don't think so. Yeah. Next. Yeah, so we, uh, I would like, to, if it's possible, to see the other one, perforation and this one. But they are close to, close to each other. So ideally, if you get perforation or you get a site you don't like, take it all out. Don't move the lid back. Try and look for a, a different area to, to paste or to, to borrow through. So this, <clears throat> this LAO, if this is 12, 1, so maybe between 12 and 1, ideally, it would be nice to go right across. But if you get, so that's why now I say, it looks good, not great. Let's look at the QRS. But we didn't have V1. For whatever reason, V1 was completely out. So we use only the spike to the, uh, can you see the ECG? So spike to the ECG. No, okay, it's fine. So spike to the ECG was over 100. I think like 115 or something. But then it, there was a lot of isoelectric. You remember I showed you? Yeah. So that guy, Marek, says no. If there's isoelectric line between the spark and the onset of the QRS, start from the onset of the QRS to the peak. If that peak is less than 80, that's fine. And that number comes from the old numbers definition of left bundle branch block, intrinsic deflection. Yeah. So it's, it's not a number that people guess. It's a number based on the physiology of a conduction system. Um, can you see it on the RAO? So on the RAO, uh, no, the previous one I just showed, the final one. So yeah, there was the one that you, I think is final. It should look towards one o'clock up. So what do you do now when you're happy? Uh, style it out first, and then you hold the lead and you pull the guide back a couple of centimeters to see how stable yeah, it is. There is a, there's a name that I've got it, um, almost like Barco. But there's a, there's a, there's a word, hinging, hinging. That's the word, hinging. So if it hinges, just play that RAO, please. Okay. You have the RAO? Even here you can see hinging, but the last one. This is septogram. Yeah, that was that was before mm -hmm. preparation. Mm -hmm. oh, the anyway, it's fine. So hinging basically, you pull back your stylet. Yeah. It doesn't show. This is nice. This is Areo. Yeah, this is after everything is after out. Here. This is up. I think everything is out here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you can see hinging nicely when you still have your guide in. Mm -hmm. So the guide protects the proximal part of the lead. The septum protects the distal part of the lead because they are both firm. Then you do this, you take this. Mm -hmm. It's called hinging. You're almost certain that at least when you sleep, it's less likely to dislodge. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you take the stylet out and they pull back the guide before slitting it by two or three centimeters, you're happy if it doesn't dislodge. Then, mm -hmm. then you can, can slit. Can we go to the first, the piece of wedding, please? Okay. How so much, the point, how much hinging would you tolerate? Uh, as long as it doesn't move, so I would. Sometimes it looks subtle, but if it moves, it moves like a straight line. No, almost like moves opposite direction. So you have to look, if you look trying to do this, it's like that. Yeah. 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 I implanted for him dual chamber pacemaker. He was doing great. Uh, but that time we were implanting in the apex. Uh, then he got uh, um, pacing induced cardiomyopathy. We upgraded him to CRTP. He did great. 
and his ejection fraction was improved to more than 50%. Uh, then uh, lead failure of the CS lead. We decided he is, uh, he, this man also, during follow-up, after uh, deterioration of his heart failure, he got diarrhea, vomiting, something like this, and he got VF, cardiac arrest, twice. So we decided to put an ICD for him. Because of the expenses and because he's pacemaker dependent, I decided to put the ICD, single chamber ICD, from the right side and keep his CRTP, which is now working as dual chamber pacemaker, from the left side. He's completely pacemaker dependent. He doesn't have any intrinsic rhythm. So I said, in case he gets infection or something, so the ICD, I can take it out. Uh, he, he was followed up, but there was more deterioration of his heart failure. We gave him all the anti-failure measures, every single one, but he's still complaining, and he's near class three, and ejection fraction is going down. So we decided to see if he has another uh, CS branch. So we had a plan. We are going to inject his CS from the femoral vein, uh, introducing the long cheese, going with the decapolar caster that was in Tanta, and Dr. Shif Habiba did this. We, in, we made venogram for his CS all over, and unfortunately, he didn't have any more veins. He was not ischemic. He did not undergo any PCI. He underwent coronary angio to make sure that he's not ischemic during this period of follow-up, was mild atherosclerotic disease. So we, we planned for him for left bundle area pacing, especially after we knew Brian is coming, so we brought him for this uh, technique, Brian. Thank you. Yeah, so that was a good introduction to left bundle pacing for me in Cairo. Yeah. But looking back, as I was going home yesterday, <clears throat> I was thinking to myself, um, uh, besides the failure of uh, maybe technique and everything, maybe this is not the case to be doing left bundle because <clears throat> of the guide and all the wires in there. Because at the end, when it kinked, maybe it contributed, uh, but Against that, the first injection we were able to, to get through. Yeah. Yeah. I think my manipulation caused the kink eventually, but trying to find an excuse that maybe with all these other leads in, you know, with the maneuvering, long case, because at the end the lead will not go through. But could you show us uh, the first, our first injection? Okay, I want to, to, show, you, to show them. This is, the, uh, this is the CRTP, and this is the defibrillator lead from the right side. And these are the leads, the right atrial lead, the right ventricular apical lead, apical pacing lead, and the defibrillator lead in the mid-septum. When we were implanting, I decided to put him in the mid-septum. And this is the CS lead in the postulateral branch, but, and it was doing perfect, then we get lead failure with no capture, actually at very high amplitude. Yeah, next. Why do you think it, it failed? I mean, after some Fibrosis. Uh, just fibrosis. Okay, let's go until, yeah. Yeah. so that's a venogram. So I was surprised it was relatively good. I mean, for three leads, I think it was good. Yeah. There was a difficulty going through here. I'm not sure why was that. So again, we're doing a septogram in the LAO projection. You can see we're right against it. You can, yeah. see, the, yeah. you can see the veil nicely there. Uh, we're rightly above the coronary sinus in the yes. LL view. Yeah, so we're okay. Is there. Yeah. Sinus, yeah. Septum, yes. Septum yeah. Is yeah. You can see. You yeah. Okay. So we think okay, it's going to be easy, quick, and out. So you can see the vino. Next, please. Next. Listen, sinus is in very yeah. Good yeah. So look at that. So we inside because this part we injecting here. This is post more posterior. You can see it's almost like. Two veils, can you see? I think the other part is just posterior. You see that veil and you see that veil. There's two veils here. Almost like H. Veil. So you see, if you look at the venogram, it's almost like an A. Can you see here? Yes. Yeah. yeah and yeah. 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 So, but that's okay. But the lid is in. Yeah. So the lid is in. Even the anode is in. It's just on the other side. But we couldn't get a nice cure. So actually, I think that was the only time we were able to borrow through the, the, the septum. Everything else, we couldn't. You can still see the helix is there, 
most of the lead is there. So at least we've got about almost 10, millim 10 millimeters of the lead into the septum because the anode is in the septum. Next. Next. So here, I think after we tried many times, we realized actually the lead is, and the reason why we didn't get good QRSs here is because with that veil at the back, it's almost the lead is doing more this than this. No. This is still LAO. I know he's not lying straight, but you can see that maybe the lead was not going deep into the septum. Yeah. yeah. Next. You can see, you see it's inside, but not deep. So now we're looking and looking. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next. Now, wherever we're trying, sometimes we're in the CS, sometimes we're in that pouch. You know, I don't know what was that part, but we just couldn't get it in. So we're trying all these other things. Actually, we never got into the septum after the, the first one. You know, but sometimes, I mean, getting into the septum is not a difficult part. It's getting into the left bundle and capture the left bundle. But getting into the septum is usually not difficult, but we just couldn't. So uh, in that paper that I gave you, uh, they call it drilling. drilling. You saw that? Yeah. Just, just drilling. Um, the concept of drilling for them is that you're turning the lead, but it's not advancing. Yes. 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 The, the lead is, um, for whatever reason, it won't move in, either because you didn't prepare it properly, or in the guide is not moving. Um, but it's a, called a drilling, which is drill, but nothing goes through. It's almost like drilling a concrete wall. So when that happens, try, and yesterday I was going home thinking out. When you get drilling, try to look at everything. Look at the lid, is it still functional? How do you do that? You turn the helix in and out, it's moving well. You, your green thing is moving well. If the lid looks fine, then you look at the guide. So our guide at the end of, I don't know, four hours, three hours, it was killed. So those are the things. So if you try a couple of times and it's not going in, that drilling phenomenon is usually either a guide or the lead is not working well. So, because if, the, if that thing comes back, the green tool, biotronic, the green tool, did you get the name? There's no name, yeah. The green tool comes back, <clears throat> the tension of the lead is gone. So whatever you do here is not transmitted to the end of the lead. You're just doing this in a flimsy lead. So, in terms of the septograms, all of these were not successful. So we end up putting uh, Prof. Merit advises to put in the septal, so we'll see um, uh, with the septal pacing if it's going to be better. But on the knowledge that we have, that septal pacing is not superior to left bundle pacing. So, but for him, because he's a responder, maybe he just needs less dyssynchrony compared to what he has. Half of the tip is in. It's not entirely. In. I'm not sure there's anything more to say in this case because it was just the same thing, the same thing. But that was challenging. It was challenging. So for me, next time, sir, if you've got so many leads, probably it's always try to protect the guide. Uh, how are you going to do that? I'm trying to think. Maybe just no forceful counter clock and clock. Uh, because there's not enough space to work with that. You don't have much leverage. Uh, but I just think that um, with conduction system pacing, if, if you ask me, yeah, yeah. all this noise looking is not looking the right direction. As long as you look at one o'clock, not two, that probably. Sometimes you always look at the ECG. If you're lucky, you're going to get it. But if you look at that and the ECG is not good, you, you're probably not surprised. Mm. Yeah, it looks nice, but not the QRS was not good. The QRS was not good. But remember, he has conductive system disease. It doesn't have any intrinsic rhythm. There is no escape. Maybe the conductive system is all the way. The way he has. Looking back, because 2020 in hindsight is 2020. Maybe we should have just left it there because we know it's in the septum, deep in the septum, closer to the yeah, closer to the left one. Yeah, yeah. Next. 
So, but yes. maybe in the future, as we go along, that yes. oh, okay, you're already thinking it's going to yes. be a difficult case because of one, two, and three. Next. Let me just leave it here. Accept the left septal pacing. Yeah. Next. Next. Because you didn't get anything Next. better after that. I didn't get anything better. So I think uh, the conduction system is going to be something that we will do with relative ease in the future. I think we're going to have the companies designing, because none of what you use at the moment was designed for lab bundle. Mm -hmm. Even the guide itself. These guides are at best for septal pacing. Maybe his. What was it designed for his? Uh, even for his. The Selectra 3 is. So I don't. So we're still gonna have maybe guides. Also, I think like prophecy, deflectable would be much better than non-deflectable. But I think if if ever I have a device clinic and you guys will be quite big at Seattle, I'll really try to to do left band pacing and. Um, Probably if you go to a place that do it, maybe go to that Poland, uh, Polish guard. It's always nice to see other people do it. Yeah. Because they, they always run this course now. Yeah. Get uh, Biotronic to sponsor it to go there two days, four or five cases, because it is not only in theory, practically, it is easier than uh, his pacing. Also, with all these other benefits of Stay stability, stable, residential, and probably disruptment better. I don't know. So I will, even though we had very challenging cases, I won't give. I won't give up on it. I will try. You know. Okay. Thank you very much, Brian, Dr. Brian Venzi from South Africa. He came all this way to help us start our program with left bundle area pacing, and I think we had. Uh, we, we suffered with him in the first case, but that was very educational to know tips and tricks. Easy cases, you don't, uh, you don't learn from easy cases. Second case was very good, and uh, we will show you the ECGs later on and presentation of this case. Thank you very much, Dr. Venzi. Thank you for the audience. Okay.